Hi, I am Dr. Sridhar Kalyana Sundaram. Welcome to my channel. This topic has been requested very frequently by many of you. I'm sorry for the delay, but uh, finally we have some update and we will be discussing the overview of hypotension and shock in units. The idea is not to describe in full detail all about the topic, but in a concise way, uh, a few important points that we need to remember about the approach to management of shock. At a later stage, I will try to do some case-based discussion on this as well. And uh, I will be presenting individual updates on inotropes, how they function, what dose to use and how we should use them as well. So, we know that the normal cellular or tissue oxygenation depends on various components, the blood flow, oxygen saturation, transport capacity for oxygen in the blood and the tissue oxygen demand. I would refer you to my playlist on oxygenation where most of these aspects are uh, discussed in detail, especially the first video on why oxygen is important. I will share the link in the text below. Shock is a condition where there is circulatory impairment leading to a state of impaired oxygen delivery to the tissues. So all of us are familiar with this concept from medical school days. So we have different causes for shock depending on the age group, the situation we deal with and so on. And the approach to the shock depends on what is the underlying cause. Why is the circulatory insufficiency important? So if it is for a short time period, there is a reserve mechanism, the cellular metabolism could be impaired but this is reversible. However, if it is prolonged, it becomes irreversible shock. It's very important to identify the shock early in the process before the decompensation happens. We have often seen children or uh, babies who deteriorate very rapidly. Whatever we do doesn't work. So they have decompensated. So once they decompensate, you cannot really revert it. We call it a vicious cycle, the acidosis, the cardiac dysfunction, the further hypotension, everything keeps going on and on and we are unable to retrieve the process irrespective of what we do after that stage. And maybe by that time the brain injury has happened as well. So even if you do manage to retrieve, there is uh, irreparable damage to the brain. So it's very critical that we identify early and it's very important to stress here that identification depends on close monitoring. So you re really depend on an expert nursing team who will support the baby and identify problems and indicate to the medical team at the earliest possible so we can act on time. So cardiovascular compromise can be due to various factors in the newborn period and you can classify it into factors due to vasodilatation. This is often seen with septic shock, systemic inflammatory disease which uh, related to NEC and so on. And we have poor contractility related to maladaptation after birth. This is in the extreme premature babies where the sudden rise in the systemic vascular resistance after the cord is clamped, babies may struggle to cope with. Asphyxia leads to a similar problem as well and septic shock in the later stages where the poor contractility adds on. If a baby has cardiomyopathy, it may affect with poor contractility. There are not many conditions in newborns with a high afterload. So we may have the maladaptation after birth as I said, the systemic vascular resistance suddenly increases and the baby may find it difficult to cope. The more premature the baby, the more difficult it is. The importance of delayed cord clamping comes in here as well that if we don't delay cord clamping, the preload is reduced as well so the baby will struggle even more. Dilated cardiomyopathy can also cause affect, uh, high afterload. In shunt and arrhythmias, PDA obviously in a premature baby may increase the blood flow and uh, make it more difficult for the pump to manage. AV malformations, I've seen many babies with vein of gallon malformation who present with the right uh, atrial volume overload, dilatation and so on. And uh, supraventricular tachycardia is not uncommon and other arrhythmias like atrial flutter may sometimes present as well. Hypovolemia thankfully is not common but you should be aware of especially if there is antipartum hemorrhage or uh, twin to twin transfusion where there may be a placental or twin to twin transfusion syndrome. You may have umbilical cord avulsion where it may be detected by the bleeding but sometimes because there is a large blood loss at delivery you may be finding it difficult to differentiate the maternal from the fetal blood loss. Uh, 
a small blood volume for the mother is actually almost the entire blood volume for the baby. A subgaleal hemorrhage is very important to identify because that can also lead to rapid blood volume loss and insensible water loss can contribute to hypovolemia in the extreme premature babies if we don't take care of the humidity or we don't replace the losses appropriately. Uh, there may be polyuria due to various factors and right ventricular dysfunction may be there. And diastolic dysfunction may happen with immature myocardium, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade. So this is basically preventing the heart from filling adequately and we may have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Most of the infant of diabetic mothers have cardio, I mean, hypertrophy of the cardiac muscle but it doesn't lead to cardiomyopathy but in the more severe ones you may find that as a problem. Of course we have to be alert about cardiac tamponade or tension pneumothorax in any sick baby and tension pneumothorax especially in a ventilated baby. So there are many factors that contribute to early cardiovascular insufficiency. So we have the immature myocardium, we have the reduced contractility, altered filling, reduced cardiac output and there is also reduced effect of the endogenous and exogenous catecholamines. The immature vasomotor tone, autoregulation is also affected. So we have decreased systemic vascular resistance, increased systemic vascular resistance which may contribute and the catecholamine response is altered in the premature baby. That's one of the reasons why the hydrocortisone might help. And patent ductus arteriosus which contributes by the nature of the shunt uh, and it's also dependent on the systemic vascular and pulmonary vascular resistance. As we know, PPHN where there is increased pulmonary vascular resistance, the shunting becomes right to left. In uh, sepsis, we have uh, altered cardiac output. The systemic vascular resistance may reduce as in the vasodilator picture that we get and uh, we may get impaired contractility as well and capillary leak may cause uh, in reduced intravascular volume. Hypoxia may affect the systemic vascular and pulmonary vascular resistance where the pulmonary vascular resistance can be increased with hypoxia as well and impaired contractility may set in as an after effect of the hypoxia. In a baby who is cooled, it's very important to note that there is increased systemic vascular resistance. There is also bradycardia that may be associated and the cardiac output may reduce so we should be careful in these cases. In respiratory conditions like respiratory distress syndrome or PPHN, we have pul high pulmonary vascular resistance, right to left shunt and hypoxia. In mechanical ventilation or pneumothorax, obviously if you are not careful, we may cause hydrogenic uh, reduction of the cardiac output. So in high frequency ventilation especially, we should be very careful of this effect and that's one of the reasons we used to monitor x-rays on a regular basis but of course nowadays we go by uh, the clinical parameters. You do an x-ray on the first few hours of high frequency and then depending on how often you make changes. Uh, the, the periphery to core central temperature difference may give you an idea as well core to peripheral difference. In case of blood loss or early cot lamping, so remember that early cot lamping is not physiologic and that is actually a source of blood loss to the baby. The blood that was supposed to come into the fetal lungs stays in the placenta, so you are depriving the blood of blood volume. So this reduced blood volume and oxygen transport capacity may result from the early cot lamping and reduced cardiac output as well. And as I mentioned earlier, in the extreme premature babies where the adaptation is already difficult, because of the sudden increase in systemic vascular resistance, the myocardium is struggling to pump and cope against it. This early cot clamping prevents the preload increase which would happen with delayed cot clamping and this compensatory mechanism is also missing in these babies. How do we assess the newborn circulation? So we have the clinical parameters, the history, the uh, assessment of the baby including heart rate, saturation and capillary refill. The lactate as a single measure and especially in the postnatal period immediately after delivery, the trend where immediately if it is high due to the labor related processes it tends to drop when the circulation is better. Urine output is important but it is a delayed measure and blood pressure is important and even though it gives good information it is a late manifestation so ideally we should pick up when the heart rate starts going up and the baby's uh, sensorium gets altered. Altered sensorium is a fairly uh, early marker. The baby becomes irritable when there is hypotension and they become lethargic when there is significant hypotension. And by the time the blood pressure drops, most of them have an altered sensorium or a depressed sensorium. So that's one of the ways to assess whether the blood pressure is reliable. If your sensorium is normal, if the baby is active and crying, 
the blood pressure if it is low is unlikely to be a real drop in blood pressure or a significant drop the echocardiography has become a very important tool the point of care ultrasound and echocardiography so we can assess different parameters the ivc filling the cardiac filling left ventricular outflow and right ventricular out output and uh, superior vena cava flow can be assessed and the ejection time there are also simple measures to assess the filling and uh, obviously uh, atrial chamber size is a good measure as well and of course assessing the duct is important in a premature baby as well so there are so many factors that play uh, which interact together and so the evaluation of the circulation is quite challenging so the clinician's analysis of a different situation depends on the experience evidence and beliefs as well as opinion of the other team members so uh, there may be artificial intelligence related support coming up as well to help with the decision making of course we need inputs from all these parameters so we have the uh, conventional physiologic monitoring with blood pressure heart rate saturation and uh, we have the clinical evaluation as we discussed so capillary refill time urine output respiratory parameters including the instability uh, temperature uh, measurement the core peripheral temperature subjective assessment as i told you the importance of the general state or the responsiveness of the child skin color clinical stability grade of activity response to the stimulus and when the baby reacts laboratory test hemoglobin as i mentioned is one of the parameters that contributes to the oxygen carrying and so it's important to have a good hematocrit in a sick baby septic workup may be considered to look at the etiology and to treat and lactate the trend of the lactate may help guide you in the treatment and also to pick up shock uh, the demographic variables which affect the approach and management may include gestational age postnatal age of the baby the blood pressure depends on the postnatal age it's totally different after the first 48 hours of life and the birth weight and gender make a difference as well there may be risk factors for early or late onset infection or necrotizing enterocolitis medical history and pregnancy related history is important and the circulatory assessment with tools mainly echocardiography and near infrared spectroscopy the pulsatility index on the newer pulse oximeters can give you a guide but it is still evolving and non invasive uh, cardiac output monitoring is coming up as well so ultimately you combine all this and make a pathophysiologic approach to the circulatory management it's very important to know what a systolic and diastolic blood pressure means and what the mean blood pressure is so the systolic blood pressure is created by the ventricular contractile function to exceed the vascular resistance or after load so basically the heart is pumping to eject the blood to the rest of the body and to it to reach the peripheral part of the body it needs to overcome the vascular resistance which is the after load so this pressure that the heart ejects uh, is the systolic blood pressure and uh, this is to push the stroke volume through the cardiovascular system the diastolic blood pressure is uh, to maintain the circulation when the heart is not pumping so it's caused by the contractile property of the arterioles uh, which also is one of the important factors for the systemic vascular resistance we need to maintain a higher pressure gradient at the arterial side the proximal more than the distal and uh, this is related to the resistance and the intravascular volume so if you are hypovolemic it's very difficult to maintain your diastolic uh, volume in a shunting lesion like the pda for example the resistance drops and so you may have a wide pulse pressure because the diastolic runoff happens the mean blood pressure is one of the commonly used measures to check the blood pressure range for treatment it's nothing but one third of the systolic with two third of the diastolic pressure so anything that impacts the systolic pressure affects the mean bp but anything that impacts the diastolic blood pressure has a bigger impact on the mean blood pressure so how do we define hypotension there is no clear definition one of the most commonly used definition is a blood pressure mean less than gestational age this is the so called bapm rule which has been practiced for so many years right from the time i have been training and probably well before that as well the german neonatal network data suggested that the bapm rule may overestimate in the extremely low birth weight babies on the first day so you may not really need that number and the review of systolic diastolic and pulse pressure in relation to the mean pressure is important as it will give us clues to the pathophysiology so you can't look at one number alone we should train ourselves to look at the systolic pressure the diastolic pressure and the pulse pressure so you may have situations where 
you have a normal mean pressure but the systolic is very low uh, where it is a contractility problem usually and you may have a very wide pulse pressure with the low diastolic pressure where again you may get a clue for the etiology and the approach to their management. So the approach to blood pressure during transition, the suggested approach is basically to look at an evaluation pressure which is the gestation, gest I mean what we said about the BAPM rule gestational age equivalent value on day one. This is where we need to evaluate the child carefully. We have to look at all the parameters we discussed earlier. The trigger pressure where one decides to intervene. So you also go by the other symptomatology, the lactate, the neurology of the baby, whether the baby is responsive. There was a concept of permissive hypotension where the uh, trigger pressure used to be lower. So even if there is a clinical hypotension on the blood pressure level, if the capillary filling is normal, if the urine output is normal, if the lactate is normal, one can decide not to intervene. We still have to form, follow that to some extent, but it's not always safe as the EpiPage study analysis had shown that the babies where the intervention was active had a better outcome compared to the babies where they allowed permissive hypotension. So it's not clear at, as to which level we should intervene, but you have to be finding the balance because inotropes or other treatments for hypotension are not totally safe either. So it's not a single value alone. It should be considered in the setting of other equally important elements, as I mentioned, the clinical, biochemical or other objective assessment criteria. Uh, the chart which gives us the range of the blood pressure for each age, so the systolic, diastolic and mean according to the gestational age. So uh, this is important uh, for you to have in your unit and to guide you with the management. So uh, you can see the lowest systolic pressure that can be accepted and the lowest mean pressure that can be uh, accepted. So within this range, you work around it. And obviously, in the immediate newborn period, your threshold can be different from after the first two days when you have to start moving up in the range. So a quick review of the approach to the treatment of shock. The first step is uh, as airway breathing circulation. So obviously, you might have uh, to secure the airway and ventilate the baby because you may reduce the work of breathing that way. And uh, circulation obviously is the key for shock. You have to treat additional parameters like antibiotics and uh, very important to think of the diagnosis. So if, for example, a chest X-ray, if it's a tension pneumothorax as a differential diagnosis, for example. So unless it's a clear cut cardiogenic shock, it's good to start with one bolus of 10 ml per kilo. And it can be given safely over 20 to 30 minutes while preparing the inotropes. If the baby is really down, you can give it as a quick push. Uh, in the labor room situation, you would give the bolus as a push. Uh, I discussed already the concept of permissive hypotension and we should be careful not to allow it to drop too much in that same scenario. A quick bedside echo could give us clues regarding the preload and the pathophysiologic approach could guide us in the appropriate choice of the inotropes as well as whether we need more volume. Uh, hydrocortisone is one of the medications that can be used and obviously the reasoning for giving hydrocortisone is to improve the responsiveness of the uh, newborn, especially the premature baby to inotropes. Uh, the catecholamine responsiveness may be poor in a premature baby and the depleted uh, receptors may be upregulated with hydrocortisone. So if the baby has poor responsiveness, we consider further fluid bolus blood transfusion, correction of contributing factors. So medications like bicarbonate to correct the acidosis is a double-edged sword. So we should be very careful when we consider using it. However, at the same time, acidosis can uh, affect the myocardial functioning. So we may need to some extent. Maintenance of an appropriate level of calcium is very important. Avoiding hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia is important. Avoiding hypothermia is important. Sometimes if a baby on therapeutic hypothermia is very unwell with Persisting hypotension, we may need to take the decision of aborting the cooling and uh, rewarm the baby quickly to allow the hypotension to be handled. So the quick factors, I'm a quick review of the pathophysiology of circulatory compromise and how we can approach. So by singling out the pathophysiology that is affecting a particular baby, we can titrate our response. So in simple terms, blood pressure is a combination of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. So we can look into the pathophysiology by looking at whether the factor is coming from a factor which affects systemic vascular resistance. Uh, 
so this may be vasodilatation or vasoconstriction and uh, it may be related to neuroendocrine and paracrine regulatory mechanisms and septic shock may play a role as well and if it is something to do with cardiac output cardiac output is a product of heart rate and stroke volume so anything that impairs the heart rate like an arrhythmia can affect and the stroke volume can be uh, affected by preload contractility and afterload so simply put the preload is related to the volume so hypovolemia a diastolic dysfunction where the complaints of the ventricle is uh, affected or a volume overload may contribute the opposite way so contractility is affected in cardiac damage poor contractility and hyperdynamic myocardium afterload is mainly related to the high afterload or a low afterload the high afterload related to hypertension which is rare in newborns and high systemic vascular resistance which is related to the adaptation phase the low afterload uh, vasodilatory conditions so if you look at the parameters the echocardiography and other factors uh, the pulse pressure the systolic blood pressure diastolic blood pressure the heart rate all these may guide you to what is happening and whether the peripheral pulses are felt or not in addition to the boluses i mean obviously saline bolus is the first one that we use and uh, if you need repeated uh, boluses sometimes we may use uh, lactated ringer solution or ringer lactate there is no significant role for uh, albumin in the newborn resuscitation and fresh frozen plasma is not routinely indicated unless there is uh, coagulopathy you may consider uh, blood transfusion where there is definite hypovolemia and uh, there are multiple inotropes that we can use and we will be discussing in detail on each one of these uh, separately but you can uh, look at the overall functions and some overlaps as well so there are inotropes which are acting mainly as uh, vasopressors so mainly dopamine and uh, there are uh, inotropes which increase the cardiac output inotrope or chronotrope effect so dobutamine and we have combined effect of uh, all these like the chronoinotropic effect and the uh, systemic arterial pressure increasing with dopamine epinephrine norepinephrine and hydrocortisone while uh, slightly increased uh, vaso i mean vascular uh, reduced vascular resistance with dobutamine and we have uh, decreased pulmonary arterial pressure with uh, milrinone and uh, a vasoconstrictive effect which is uh, pure with vasopressin and epinephrine as well in addition we have to look at the effects on the regional perfusion like cerebral renal and splanchnic so there are so many overlapping factors which make you decide obviously epinephrine and norepinephrine are very potent vasopressin is used mainly for uh, uh, catecholamine resistant blood pressure and milrinone is used in situations where there is uh, raised pulmonary arterial uh, pressure or pulmonary hypertension with uh, a systemic uh, with the condition where you need to use inotropy so we should be aware that milrinone can cause a drop in blood pressure so we should have a background inotrope if needed and the loading dose of milrinone is avoided in the newborn period as well and of course for pulmonary vascular resistance you may need to use inhaled nitric oxide and we also have prostaglandin as an additional tool where the duct may divert the blood flow and may help uh, decompress the effect on whichever chamber we are targeting so in summary there is no approach that will suit all babies a careful assessment constant monitoring and titrating of action is very important attention to detail like flushing of the tubings uh, the inotrope should be ready to go into the patient and we should avoid periods when the inotrope is not flowing so we should always have the replacement ready uh, act quickly on the findings and change if you have an invasive blood pressure monitoring you don't really need to be uh, weaning it very slowly 10 to 15 minutes is reasonable time and if the blood pressure is high that is not good for the baby as well especially with in a premature baby with altered auto regulation so wean quickly as well and sometimes a simple adjustment of the ventilation may be enough review whether you really need the sedation that you are using because sedative medications may significantly affect the uh, vascular distribution and they make it very challenging for example midazolam which is used as a sedative may cause significant third spacing of fluids and uh, the lack of drive from the baby uh, removes the muscle movements and the venous return reduces so the preload may reduce as well 
and an active baby has the endogenic endogenous peep and the effect of overventilation may be reducing as well so hydrogenic problem should be avoided and the uh, outcome depends on the underlying condition so whether we use the inotropes or not the outcome may not change that's one of the reasons why the studies which compare the effect of inotropes actually may show a worse outcome in the group that received the inotropic treatment uh, i hope uh, this is helpful we will also look at the uh, individual inotropes i had shared an article and i'll be mentioning the reference in the end as well so in terms of dopamine the suggested uh, action may depend on the dose that is used so less than or equal to 2 microgram per kg per minute so most of the inotropes it's kilogram uh, microgram per kg per minute and dopaminergic receptors uh, organism is responsible for the proposed renotubular effect and it may also improve the intestinal and coronary vasodilatation however there are many people who question this and very rarely that we use this dose at uh, doses above 5 and up to 10 microgram we have uh, beta 1 adrenergic receptor organism mainly we get a chronotropic effect and above 10 microgram we have the alpha adrenergic receptor organism and vasoconstriction so the effect on the blood pressure would really start at more than 10 microgram so uh, you have to be aware of the dose dependent response of dopamine and usually we don't cross 20 microgram as the vasoconstriction may increase so much that even if the blood pressure goes up your peripheral uh, circulation may drop and one more important factor about dopamine uh, we have to look at the potential clinical uses so it's a vasopressor which increases blood pressure if the blood pressure itself requires treatment it may help to increase the urine output and it has a modest effect on the cardiac output it has a, a chronotropic effect as well the tachycardia can be a side effect and it aggravates stress to both the ventricles because of the chronotropic effect as well as the increased after load and uh, at a dose of more than 10 microgram it may aggravate the pulmonary hypertension so it's an important drug to avoid in a baby with pulmonary hypertension the same applies to a baby with perinatal asphyxia because you have a uh, increased uh, pulmonary vascular resistance in this group as well so meconium aspiration syndrome pphn uh, perinatal asphyxia avoid dopamine it has a decreased effect uh, if you use it long term as the indirect pathway substrate so one of the indirect mechanisms is release of norepinephrine and if the norepinephrine in the cardiac muscle becomes depleted it doesn't uh, function so it's an indirect action so this is about uh, dopamine so the key message uh, very low doses may not be really useful and uh, very high dose can be harmful avoid dopamine in any situation with raised pulmonary vascular resistance coming to dobutamin so the dosing is 3 to 15 microgram per kilogram per minute though many of us go to 20 microgram and many of us give dopamine and dobutamin in parallel at least in the past we used to the beta 1 adrenergic receptor organism with chronotropy and inotropy and it has a beta 2 adrenergic receptor causing peripheral vasodilatation so this is one of the reasons why we can give dobutamin where you are not looking to actually increase the blood pressure but you are wanting to support the myocardium so perinatal asphyxia is an example where you may have systemic vascular resistance which is increased there are some situations in septic shock where dobutamin may be helpful as well uh, though norepinephrine is a preferred choice in septic shock the clinical uses so cardiogenic shock where uh, you don't want the systemic vascular resistance to increase Uh, but it has an unpredictable effect on the blood pressure because the vasodilatation may sometimes contribute to the blood pressure dropping so it can also cause tachycardia and we should avoid in cardiac outflow obstruction uh, especially in infants of diabetic mothers so if you have a hypertrophic uh, cardiac septum we should not uh, use dobutamine if you consider any other outflow tract obstruction like atrial stenosis or coaptation again you would not use dobutamine if possible epinephrine is more often used these days we are continuing we are rather than flogging the dopamine dobutamine sequence many of us use hydrocortisone after going to dopamine dobutamine before we go to epinephrine we don't prefer the epinephrine or epinephrine as a first line because they are very potent even a small adjustment in dose may lead to an high effect and hypertension as we said before is not good for the baby uh, 
so the dosing uh, 0 0.02 to 0 0.1 microgram per kilogram per minute mainly beta 1 and some beta 2 adrenergic receptor agonism so you have chronotropy and inotropy there is a modest decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance with epinephrine in more than 0.1 microgram per kilogram the alpha adrenergic receptors cause vasoconstriction so uh, more than 0.2 should not be used at any time uh, and it is equal to almost the uh, boluses that we give during the resuscitation so if you go to 0.2 microgram per kilogram per minute it's like the uh, 10 microgram per uh, kilogram dose we are giving as a bolus for the baby so that's a very high dose and we should avoid using it so as it is an inotrope with the vasopressive action it can be used with hypotension with reduced cardiac contractile function with, with or without vasoplegia like septic shock or asphyxia and at a dose of 0 0.02 to 0 0.05 uh, microgram per kg per minute it may increase the cardiac output more than the systemic vascular resistance so this is a useful dose like a dobutamine like function and uh, the side effects include hyperlactatemia and hyperlysemia due to the vasoconstriction becoming more it can cause tachycardia it may increase the myocardial oxidative stress as i said it's very potent so you may not be able to predict uh, to what extent it will affect so it's very important use with caution in cardiac outflow tract obstruction like in infants of diabetic mothers so again uh, same as in dobutamine so we should not be using it as in the early doses it may cause uh, more cardiac output improvement norepinephrine is not very frequently used however you may consider it uh, at a dose of 0 0.02 to 0 0.4 microgram per kilo per minute it has alpha 1 effect more than beta 1 more than beta 2 and uh, it causes potent vasoconstriction with the mild inotropy so it's used in conditions with significant vasoplegia as i said in septic shock it can be uh, the inotrope of choice uh, if the pathophysiology would support in the post-surgical inflammation and in asphyxia as well it, this is important as in these settings you may have a mild uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction so the pulmonary vasodilator effect will help it can cause tachycardia and it may also affect the regional tissue perfusion due to potent vasoconstriction so norepinephrine we should be familiar now as it's used more often and where it is dopamine resistance you can go to norepinephrine vasopressin is a backup most of us have not used it probably i have not used it in a single case so far the dose range it's very very small dosing so 0 0.0002 to 0 0.005 units per kilogram per minute so the vasopressin 1a receptor agonism leads to vasoconstriction as we know we can use it in uh, bleeding due to dilated varices and similarly the hepatic circulation uh, a significant vasoconstrictor immediate effect so it's uh, improves the blood pressure in catecholamine resistant hypotension or shock so if a baby has gone to that stage most probably we are in a situation where we lose the baby so it's like a losing battle we should be aware of the side effects of hyponatremia transient thrombocytopenia liver necrosis severe vasoconstriction related and limb necrosis so thankfully we don't need it very often but it's important to be aware Mildrinone is more frequently used nowadays with the cardiologist supporting us in the pathophysiologic study as well and uh, it's a very useful drug in pulmonary hypertension where the systemic pressure is maintained and uh, the, we should be careful that we are on either adequate dose of inotrope and uh, we also don't give the loading dose in this situation so dose is 0 0.25 to 0 0.75 microgram per kg per minute it's a type 3 phosphodiesterase receptor inhibitor and it increases the cyclic AMP level so it mainly has an inotropic, lucitropic and a pulmonary vasodilator effect. Systemic vasodilation is possible that's why we should be careful to avoid it in hypotension and in newborns we should avoid the loading dose of uh, mildrinone. So as we discussed inotropic lucitropic effect with mild pulmonary vasodilatation and the pulmonary hypertension with the post pedial ligation situation as well it's a good drug to use loading dose not needed while the action may take one to two hours the side effects include relatively slow onset tachycardia hypotension if there is reduced intravascular volume or if you administer a loading dose platelet function we should be careful in a premature baby as uh, it may cause bleeding uh, 
um, decreased clearance with kidney function. I have used mildenone in a few babies, especially in one baby with severe pulmonary hypertension uh, who responded very well. And uh, there is more and more uh, room for uh, cardiology reviews or support and echocardiography, and we can consider using this. As I mentioned, there are uh, some situations where uh, prostaglandin can be considered as well to keep the duct open as a kind of uh, decompressing effect on the uh, right heart. And uh, it's not very commonly used in this situation, but we can consider that in certain situations refractory. This is the uh, reference from which these uh, inotrope related impact is taken. It's a very useful article and I have shared it on my Facebook group and the Telegram group as well. If you are not following that, you can uh, subscribe to those as well. Uh, thank you. I hope uh, this lecture has been useful.